Muslim physicians and medieval scribes. By the 13th century, it was being taught throughout the universities of Europe. In the Renaissance, scholars rearranged his books into catalogues with exquisite illustrations depicting the creatures that Aristotle had seen. They founded museums full of natural wonders, not unlike this one in a small village near the lagoon. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say that modern biology was founded on Aristotle. Which raises the question, why have we forgotten him? Why has he no place in the pantheon of great scientists next to, say, Pasteur or Darwin? One reason is that some of his biology was very simply wrong. He was very wrong about eels. Whoa, it's a big one. What a gorgeous fish. <laughs> Which kind is it? Is it a leptocephalus or brachycephalus? Leptocephalus. Leptocephalus. Aristotle says that the eels grow from the mud at the bottom of the rivers. Why would he say that? Well, because basically, if you see eels, even big ones, especially the small ones, yeah. they hide in the mud. They can easily just, uh, in the mud, they just uh, go direct inside and disappear inside in the mud. See, all this time we never saw an eel with eggs. So what do you think that tells us? I don't know, this is a mystery. This is a hell mystery. Nobody knows. Well, marine biologists do know. But Aristotle certainly didn't. See, he turns, 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 turns. He See? says he's trying to, yes. So when they buy, they turn like that. I think we've got enough, don't you? Yeah. Aristotle noticed that eels are very unusual creatures. If you do a ventral incision, if you make a ventral incision of this sort in order to look at its internal organs through to the rectum, down beyond what you see are all the regular organs that you would find in any fish. But in a regular fish, the reproductive organs would be somewhere right around here, the gonads, the sperm and the eggs. However, in eels, you simply never find them. Aristotle noticed this, and for him, it raised the obvious question. How, if an eel doesn't have eggs or sperm, does it reproduce? It's a reasonable question. He could, of course, not know that the European eel develops its gonads in the course of a 9,000 kilometer swim to its spawning grounds in the Sargasso Sea. He seems to think that some kinds of creatures don't reproduce. They just appear from nowhere. They spontaneously generate, to use this term. That's What's right. all that about? He noticed that, that some animals don't come about from animals of the same kind. So humans can produce tapeworms or fleas. And he extends this to other animals in other parts of nature, in the sea above all, but also with almost all insects. Um, quite why he does that is a very peculiar question. 
for nearly 2,000 years after Aristotle. As a consequence of Aristotle, people believed that lots of different creatures, insects, snails, clams, spontaneously generated that they didn't actually even reproduce. Had an immense influence on biology. A disaster. One of, one of Aristotle's less happy theories. Less happy theories. One of his catastrophic mistakes, I would say. Aristotle observed that putrefying flesh often seems to breed other creatures. Take this European glass lizard, which we have conveniently found dead at the side of a road. I'm cutting it up in order to see what's inside. The lizard has become rather mummified in the intense heat. We see, perhaps unsurprisingly, that it's crawling with maggots. Now, Aristotle knows that flies come from maggots, and he knows that maggots come from putrefying flesh. And so he concludes, not unreasonably, that flies are, in his words, spontaneously generated from dead things. And you, you find these just here in, in uh, Kalani? Yeah, just in here in Port. Are the fish from Kalani? Are they nice? No, of course. No. Very the best. The best. The best. And I'll take one of these guys. Aristotle's belief in spontaneous generation wasn't, however, the real reason he became discredited. Rather, it was the failings in his method that this belief exposed. When I read Aristotle, it's like reading the work of a brilliant, albeit eccentric colleague. There are the same detailed observations, the closely argued theory, the same invidious references to predecessors. But there's one thing that's missing, the thing that defines modern science, experiment. I place two fresh fish in two jars, cover one with gauze, and leave the other exposed. It's the kind of experiment that Aristotle might have done, but didn't. A week later, I look at the results. This fish has been left open and exposed to the elements. And it is crawling with maggots, such as this one here. And the fish that has been covered in gauze, by contrast, there's plenty of rotting meat, but there aren't any maggots. And that proves that in order to get maggots in rotting meat, you first have to get flies that lay eggs in them. And that, in all its simplicity, was the experiment that Francesco Redi did in 1668. It demolished Aristotle's theory of spontaneous generation, and his reputation never recovered. At the heart of the story lies a tragic paradox. For nearly 2,000 years, where men inquired about the natural world, they first asked, what did Aristotle think? And such was the force of his mind and the scope of his investigations that invariably he had an answer.
And that was a problem. Aristotle, or rather his epigons, became an impediment to progress. The battle cry of modern science was sounded, study nature, not books. And by that they meant Aristotle's books. He was turned into a symbol of the muddle-headed past. And with some reason, he was the giant who had to be slain so that we could pass through the gates of philosophy and reach the green fields of scientific truths that lay beyond. Aristotle stayed in Lesbos for just two years. He was offered a job, tutor to a princeling called Alexander, whom history would call the Great. Later, he returned to Athens, where he founded his own philosophical school. He thought, wrote, and in 322 BC, died. What then are we to make of Aristotle? Should we praise him for his prescience or condemn him for his errors? I think he gives us this. He tells us that creatures are exquisitely fitted to their environments, that they are adapted, and that that adaptation requires an explanation. He also says that complex things such as creatures cannot simply self-assemble from their constituent parts, but rather that they need something else. They need information. And he tells us that if we want to understand living things, we have to take them apart, we have to reduce them down to their individual bits and pieces, but that once we have done so, we also have to put them back together again, for only when we do so will we really understand how they work. And it is this that I think makes Aristotle speak to us today, for if taking things apart was the task of 20th century biology, putting them back together again is the task of the 21st. He is important because he gives us the very structure of our thought, even when we do not know it ourselves. His thought flows like a subterranean river through the history of our science, surfacing now and then as a spring with ideas that are apparently new, but are in fact very old. Is this view of Aristotle anachronistic? I don't think so. He is so vast, so protean, that each generation must read him anew. For when they do, they always find things in him that their predecessors have missed. Aristotle wrote thousands of sentences, but one, the first in his metaphysics defines him. All men, he says, desire to know. But, he continues, not all forms of knowledge are equal. The best is the pure and disinterested search for the causes of things. And he has no doubt searching for them is the best way to spend a life. It's a claim for the beauty and worth of science. And on Thursday here on BBC4, don't miss our volatile history of chemistry. There's a little taster of that coming right up. Next tonight, drama in Simon Nye's adaptation of the Gerald Durrell classic, My Family and Other Animals.